God, thank, thank you, Pastor Donna, and thank you for Brad for that prayer as well. Uh, we've been blessed so far this morning already, haven't we? Um, I do have um, a, an action-packed message from God's Word today, and so uh, without any further ado, I'd love to just get straight into it, um, but I'm going to ask for one, uh, one more word of prayer, so let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I come before you at this time and I pray for an extra measure of your Holy Spirit. Lord, as we consider your word, uh, we pray that you would lead us into truth. We claim the promise of Scripture that you will do that very thing, that you'll lead us into truth. And Lord, we we pray uh, that you would tailor make this message to uniquely fit the circumstances of each individual's life here today. Uh, Lord, may you uh, give us ears to hear. Lord, may you give me uh, the the ability to articulate clearly the message that you would have us uh, here today. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to start by getting a little bit of audience participation here. I want to ask the question, uh, what period of Bible history do you think would be the most exciting to have lived in and why? What period of Bible history, uh, period of Bible history do you think would have been the most exciting to have lived in and why? Um, and someone who wants to share us something, you can just raise your hand, shout it out. Tell me, what do, what do you think? What period? Yeah, wouldn't that have been spectacular to see God work in such a dramatic way uh, right before their very eyes? It would have been a very exciting time to have lived, wouldn't it? Uh, Someone else? Yes, up the back. Wouldn't it? Uh, To see God's anointed leading his church, uh, leading his people forward. I think that would have been very exciting to have seen. Yes, brother. Amen. Amen. You know, we get to read about the, uh, Jesus in the Gospels, and we get to hear about the stories and, and the miracles that he, that he performed. Uh, but imagine being in person, seeing that very thing. That would have been an exciting time to have lived in. Yes. Yes. Wouldn't it be so exciting? I agree with you. I think it would be such an exciting time. Uh, you know, we could probably go on for some time. We could probably spend actually the rest of our time together, uh, our sermon time together doing this. And I think that would probably be a very edifying time. And we could just say the benediction and head out to lunch. Um, but I, I want to I share something with you. There's a reason why I've asked this question. Um, you know, if I was to answer this question for myself, uh, I'd give a, an answer. And I, I, you may be surprised by the answer that I would give. Uh, and I want to spend today unpacking why I would give that answer. Uh, if I was to answer today what period of Bible, uh, of, of Bible history that I'd like to have lived in and why, um, I would say today. I would say today. We are living in prophetically significant and exciting time of the history of the church. Uh, we are living in a time where uh, miraculous and dramatic things are taking place and in the very near future will take place. And I believe that it's an exciting and prophetically significant time to be committed to the life and mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, and so that would be my answer if, if I was going to answer. And the reason being is because God's Word tells us in the very near future, God's people will experience the greatest revival in the history of Christian in, the, in Christian history, the greatest revival. God's people will experience the greatest revival ever. That's an exciting thing for me. I want to show you what Scripture says about this time. Um, and we'll see if I can get this going. Here we go. Uh, I, want to sh- I want to show you what the Bible tells us about this, this revival that will come across God's people. Have a look at Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 and 2. It says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, And the earth was lightened with his glory, and he cried mightily with a loud voice. And so this revival that God's people will experience, the Bible tells us uh, that it will come with great power, that it will lighten the whole earth with its glory. This revival will have such an effect that it will go around the globe. And the Bible tells us that it will be like a loud voice that will go out. It will be heard from every corner of the world. This is exciting. Look at, have a look at Joel chapter 2 and see what Joel says about this same uh, experience, this same revival. Joel chapter 2 tells us that it will come to pass afterwards, speaking of the last days, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. 
Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, uh, apocalyptic signs. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it will come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. In one of my favorite books, The Great Controversy, Ellen White comments on this experience that God's people will uh, be having that we've just seen in Scripture. Uh, and this is what she says about this. She says, Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the, on the world, there will be among the people of God such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. Are you excited about experiencing this sort of a revival? Are you looking forward to receiving the blessings of God's Holy Spirit and all of the abundant blessings that come along with that? Are you, are you looking forward to that? Well, today I want to tell you, friends, not to look forward to receive it, but to look backwards. We've titled the message today, The History of the Future. Uh, and I believe that by looking back at the apostolic church, we can learn some significant lessons that prepared and equipped them to receive the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit at Pentecost that will prepare and equip us to receive the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit in uh, these days right in our very near future, to prepare us to receive this similar revival experience that God's people in the early church, in the apostolic church experienced. Uh, and so what I'd like to do with you this morning is take you through four simple lessons from the apostolic church. Four things that I think the apostolic, the, the church of Acts, were able to put into practice in their daily lives, in their Christian walk, that prepared and equipped them to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and live life of, live a life of revival and commitment to God's Spirit. And so uh, I want to take you on this journey together. The first lesson that I'd like to share with you is that the apostolic church loved Jesus more than they loved their own lives. Did you know that love is the greatest motivator in the entire universe? It was love that caused Jacob to work seven years for Rachel, which ended up being 14 years for Rachel. And he said this, he said it seemed like only a few days to him because his love for her was so strong, because of the love that he had for her. Love is the greatest motivator in the universe. It turns the Christian experience from a life of I must do, I have to do obligation to a life of I get to do service. Love is the greatest motivator in the world. This perhaps is why Jesus said, uh, this, I believe this is why Jesus said that uh, love is the greatest commandment. It's the greatest of all commandments and all the commandments can be summed up in this because it's the greatest motivator in the, in the, in the, in the entire universe. Jesus showed us practically what love looks like when uh, scripture says that greater love has no one than this than to lay down his own life for one's friend. Jesus came and modeled what that would look like, what it would look like to lay down his life to uh, love others more than self. And because Jesus modeled this, the apostolic church learned in the same way that Jesus modeled it to love Jesus more than they loved their own lives. And we see this uh, in the experience of the disciples. I'd like to take you to the book of Acts and we're going to have a look here at how the apostolic church, or one example of how the apostolic church were able to put this characteristic into practice in their own lives. We're picking up the story in Acts chapter 5 and we're going to pick it up in verse 25, but I want to give you a little bit of context here. When Jesus sent the disciples out, uh, when he went back to heaven, he sent the disciples out and he said, go and make disciples of all the nations. Uh, do Spread the gospel. And as they went out, he warned them that there would be, they'd, they'd run into conflict, that there would be times where they would face opposition, trials. And he said, don't be discouraged by this, but move forward. And so the apostles, the disciples, they went forward and they began to preach the gospel and teach and heal. And as they did this, they came across opposition. They came across people who were unhappy with the mission that they had been called to do. And at one, on one occasion that we're about to look at, as they were preaching, teaching, healing, the, uh, this troubled the religious rulers 
who, uh, who were frustrated by these uh, young group of people preaching the, the, about Jesus. And so they decided to grab them and lock them up and put them in prison. prison. And uh, God miraculous, miraculously delivered them from prison by opening the jail gate and letting them walk free. Um, and, and look at here where we pick the story up as we see how the religious rulers respond to this very thing. Um, they sent to go get these, uh, these young problem causes out of prison. And look at what happened in verse 25. The Bible says, So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing at the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them uh, without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you have filled all of Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. When Peter and the apostles were faced with opposition, they made the steadfast commitment to follow what God, the calling that God had put on their life over any uh, government or dictate uh, that was uh, enforced over them. And so uh, they went straight back out and they preached and they continued to preach. And so the religious rules were troubled. They didn't know what to do. And so they began to deliberate among themselves. And Gamaliel, one of the, uh, the Jewish leaders, stood up and he said, hey, let's just let this happen. Some of them wanted to kill them. Some of them wanted to throw them in prison. He says, let's just let this go. Let's let them go. If this is of God, it will, we can't do anything to stop it. But if this is of man, it will just fall away like so many other failed movements before it. Let's let this go. Uh, and this seemed like wise advice to the Jewish re uh, leaders. So they, they agreed to this plan. And look across here in verse 40 uh, as we see uh, what they did. In verse 40, it says, They agreed with him, agreed with Gamaliel, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. When the apostles faced opposition, they walked out of that place rejoicing that they were worthy to suffer shame for his name's sake. They didn't, they, their, their lives were on the line. Their, uh, you know, their, their health was on the line. Uh, their futures were on the line. But when faced with opposition, they were able to count it worthy to suffer shame for his name's sake. Jesus was more important to the early church than even their own lives. They were willing to put their lives at risk to follow Christ and the calling that he had put on, his, on their lives. If you and I were brought to, to trial for preaching Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict us? Are you willing to lay down your life for Christ? Do you love Jesus more than even you love your own life? This is the question that the, the, the early church were, ask, were, were uh, asking themselves, and this is the way they move forward in mission. They put uh, Jesus before everything else, even their own lives. Um, I think this is why uh, um, you know, God's faithful people all the way throughout history uh, have been willing to love not their lives even unto the death. They've been willing to put everything, to put Christ before all, and this is a posture that I believe we can learn from and we need to take today as well. Uh, in Acts of the Apostles, page 36, uh, it says this about the disciples. It says, As they meditated upon Christ's pure, holy life, they felt that no toil would be too hard, no sacrifice too great, if only they could bear witness in their lives to the loveliness of Christ's character. When you truly understand what Christ did for you on that, on that tree... When you truly understand what he did for you on the cross, there is no other possible response but to give your life wholly and completely back to him in every way. And this is why Christ said, I am, if I am lifted up, will draw all men to me. When we gain this comprehension, there can be nothing greater than to hold on to Christ. 
And the, uh, the disciples understood this, and I, I, I want to present to you, to recommend to you today that we can learn this same lesson. Uh, this is why I believe uh, Paul was able to say in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, that his life was, he, he considered his life worth nothing to him. His only aim was to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus had set before him, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. What a posture. We see that the early church loved Jesus more than they loved even their own lives. What a powerful lesson that we can learn today. The second lesson that I'd like to share with you, and we're going to move quite quickly through these um, as best I can. <laughs> God help me. Um, they understood, the disciples understood their prophetic identity and they embraced their mission publicly. I think this is such an important principle that we can learn from the early church. I want to share with you why. Let's have a look in Acts chapter 2 and we'll see how this was put into practice in the, uh, the lives of the early church. In Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 14, we're going to pick the story up here. Uh, we have the disciples waiting for the Pentecost, the experience of Pentecost, and they're praying and they're waiting. And when Pentecost comes, they walk out and they begin to preach with the power of the Holy Spirit. And as they preach, they receive the biblical gift of tongues, the ability to preach in their own language, and yet for the many mixed multitudes and nations around to hear the preaching of God, of the Word of God in their own language. And uh, they receive this gift of tongues. And as they preach, uh, you know, all these people understand what they're preaching. Uh, but there's an accusation that comes. And the accusation uh, is that these men were drunk. And that they were just babbling on. And so I want to take you and have a look at how Peter addresses this accusation. And I think it's very powerful. In Acts chapter 14, we read, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and he said to them, Men of Judea and all you who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. They're not drunk. But this is what, listen to how he responded, how he answered this criticism. But this is what was spoken by of the prophet Joel. And he goes to quote that passage that we just read a little bit earlier on today. It will come to pass in the last days, says God, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters uh, will prophesy. And he quotes the whole text there. You can read it for yourself. In answer to the priest's accusation, Peter points to Bible prophecy. He points to the prophet Joel and he points to uh, the reality that a prophecy was being fulfilled in front of their very eyes. That they were seeing an, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy right in front of them. He says, we're not drunk. We're not crazy. Actually, what you're seeing is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Peter understood where he sat in the great timeline, prophetic timeline, he understood that what was happening in front of him was actually something that was prophesied in Scripture. And that was able to give him clarity and answer accusations of critics and those who uh, opposed his ministry. He saw where he sat in prophecy. Uh, now we know that this prophecy that he quoted in Joel chapter 2 is uh, speaking of the last days. It's, it says before the great and awesome day of the Lord. We know that this prophecy of this Holy Spirit being poured out uh, in a revival experience is a prophecy for the very end times. But Peter, under divine inspiration, applied this prophecy to his very own time as well. Uh, and, and what we have here is the concept of the former and latter reign in Scripture. And so if you're unfamiliar with this concept, uh, there's, there's, uh, the former and latter reign uh, was a process uh, whereby the God's people, the Hebrew people, were a nomadic people. They traveled around. Uh, most other ancient civilizations would be based in one location, and it was usually around a water source, like the Egyptians with the Nile. And the reason for that is very obvious, because... You need water to survive, to grow your crops. And so God's people uh, were not able to do that. And so they relied completely and wholly upon God to provide that, what they needed in material blessings of rain to grow their crops. And so what would happen is that they would plant their crops at the right time. And then uh, in the autumn, a former rain, physical rain, would fall. 
uh, as a sign of God's blessing to begin to grow the crops. And then in the springtime, a latter rain would fall to ripen, mature, and mature the crops for harvest. And this was the former and the latter rain. It had a very uh, physical um, fulfillment. Uh, but in the same capacity, uh, uh, but just as there was uh, God provision physically, uh, there's also the theme in Scripture of God providing spiritually as well. Uh, through giving his people everything they need for the tasks at hand that he's called them to do. God's biddings are his enablings. He never calls us to do something that's beyond the possibility or or beyond our ability to do. And so God provides the the necessary uh, measure of the Holy Spirit for us to move forward. And so uh, in uh, in the experience of the Pentecost here, we see that God was giving them an extra measure of the Holy Spirit, a former reign, so to speak, Uh, a a raining down of his spirit on their life to be able to move them forward with the proclamation of the gospel. And uh, and then, of course, at the end of time, we have a latter rain for the the same purpose. Um, And I want to show you this uh, this concept here in the Great Controversy. Ellen White picks up this theme of Scripture, and this is what she says. She says, The work will be similar to the day of Pentecost, speaking of the last days. As the former rain was given in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel, so uh, it was to cause the upspringing of the precious seed, so the latter rain will be given at the close for the ripening of the harvest. Uh, we see this concept here of that former and that latter rain. And so this is, this is a uh, powerful example of how the early church were able to see where they sat in prophecy. And they allowed, Peter and the other apostles, allowed that where they sat in prophecy, they used their knowledge of where they sat in prophecy to guide them moving forward and to answer accusations of those who were around them, to say, hey, this is what we're doing. It, God's called us to do this. It's prophesied in Scripture. Uh, we see another example about, of this in the 70-week prophecy. And I'm not going to take the time to unpack this in its entirety, but we did uh, this morning even go through some of this in our Sabbath school lesson. And uh, we, we, what we see with the 70-week prophecy is that God had given a job to his people. To the Hebrew people, he gave them a job. They were to be a light to the other nations, and they were to tell the good news of God's grace uh, and, and to represent God to the world. But conti- consistently throughout the Old Testament, they failed to do the job that they had been raised to do. They failed to represent God. And so God gave a 70-week w- uh, prophecy, a period of 490 years of probation to his people to, to do the job that you've been given to do or that will go to someone else. And so this prophecy was given, which started, as we learnt this morning in our Sabbath school lesson, from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and went all the way through to uh, Christ's ministry, a powerful prophecy that predicted the exact date that Jesus would be baptized, crucified, and that the gospel would go to the Gentile world. Um, And so what we see uh, is that when we get to the end of this prophecy, when when Jesus was crucified... uh, before, he, sent before, he sent out his disciples after he'd risen to go and to, to do the work. He said, go first to Judea and Jerusalem. Start with the Jewish people. The time of probation had not yet finished. The time of AD 34 when that, 70, oh, that 490 years had not yet completed. And so he said, go, go speak to the lost children of, of Israel. And then in AD 34, uh, Stephen was stoned. The Christian missionary who was taking this, go- this message that the Jewish people were supposed to be doing, he was stoned. And guess who stoned him? The Jews stoned him. And so we see an ex- we, what we see happening is that God's people, the period of probation that he had given them, they failed to do their job. They crucified the Messiah. And then when g- the message was going out through Stephen, they stoned him. And so at the end of that prophecy, in AD 34, the gospel was then given to the Gentile world to take, to go out to the Gentile world. And do we see, this is the 70-week prophecy, do we see examples in the New Testament of the early church taking the gospel to the Gentile world? Do we see examples of that? In the book of Acts, it's everywhere. We see Paul raised up to be an apostle to the Gentiles uh, in, in Acts chapter 9 with his conversion. Uh, we see in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, a Gentile who was, uh, received the Holy Spirit. We see the Council of Jerusalem in, in Acts chapter 15, designed to make the gospel accessible to the Gentile people. We see missionary journeys. And what this is evidence of is the fact that God's people uh, used prophecy to guide them 
in what they should be doing and what their mission should be doing. The prophecy tells us, 70-week prophecy tells us that in AD 34, the Gospels go, go to the Gentile world. And right on time, the church is raised and God's people use where they fit in prophecy to guide how they should be living their life, what their mission should be, how they should be doing what they're doing. I love the, the quote in the Sabbath school lesson um, today, actually. It was, actually, it was from yesterday. I want to read it to you because I think this is so powerful. It says, The time of Christ's coming, his anointing by the Holy Spirit, his death and the giving of the gospel to the Gentiles were definitely pointed out. This, referring here to this, uh, this prophecy. It was the privilege of the Jewish people to understand these prophecies and to recognize their fulfillment in the mission of Jesus. Christ had urged his disciples to study the book of Daniel. You remember that in Matthew 24? He said, study the book of Daniel, know it, and you'll understand it. And so these prophecies were understood. The, the, uh, the early church was able to look at the mission that they had based on where they fat, sat in prophecy. Uh, they were able to study the books of Daniel and understand and know. Uh, w you know, there's a powerful lesson in this for us today. Uh, we, as a Seventh-day Adventist church, have a special mission that we have been raised to do. And we can learn about that mission when, by looking at Bible prophecy. As we look at where we fit in the great prophetic timeline, the disciples were able to guide their mission, their mission by looking here. When we go down to the end of that prophecy in 1844, we see a new mission, or an extension of the, of the mission, and a specific message to go to the world. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we have the privilege to be able to study Scripture and understand where we fit in Bible prophecy, and I promise you that that will guide our mission as we move forward and keep us on the, the narrow path, the way that we should be heading. Um, and I want to encourage you, if you haven't had the opportunity to study this remarkable prophecy, please take the time to do so. Um, and, and I'm sure Pastor Data will be happy to help with that. Um, I want to share with you a third lesson that we can learn from the Apostolic Church. Uh, I believe that the Apostolic Church based their entire lives upon the Word of God. Everything that they did, they based upon the Word of God. And I want to recommend to you today, friends, that we need to do the same. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, uh, we're going to, 41 and 42, we'll, we're in, already in Acts chapter 2, so you can just flick your eyes straight across. Uh, we see this. This is what it says about the early church. It says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Uh, and in four, verse 41 that I missed there, it says, those who gladly received his word were baptized and, and thousands were added to them and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. You know, doctrine is a, is a word that means teachings of scripture. And so what we see is the early church continuing steadfastly in the teachings of scripture, continuing steadfastly in the word of God, basing their entire lives upon the word of God. You know, uh, for some reason, uh, there are some circles where doctrine is made fun of, uh, where it's you know, kind of set up as something that's the antithesis of Christ or against Christ, or I'd rather just talk about Jesus rather than doctrine, uh, or you know, any, all of these sorts of things. Uh, I want to encourage you, friends, that this is not the posture that the early church took. They based their lives steadfastly on the apostles' doctrine. They based their lives entirely on the Word of God. There wasn't a, 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 a contradiction here. It was together. It was the same thing, the teachings of Scripture. And this is what the disciples did. They based everything they did on the Word of God. This is why in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2-4, to 4, we find this powerful passage of Scripture. It says, Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And notice this for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and they'll be turned aside to fables. Friends, I want to tell you that this prophecy is being fulfilled in front of our very eyes today. Uh, we see examples of people heaping up for themselves teachers just because they want to hear what their itching ears want to hear. 
They want to hear something that will make them comfortable. But God's word is not to be bent to our preferences. We need to, as Christians, as people who follow the word of God, as the early church did, we need to base everything that we do upon the clear teaching of the word of God. And we need to avoid and work against any reduction of that, in, even in the Christian church. Uh, and I think that's a powerful thing that we need to learn. I want to tell you today that it is never safe to allow culture to drive truth. It's never safe to allow culture to drive your perception of what's true. Well, why is this the case? Because culture are not concerned with c commitment to God's word, by and large. And so we need to base everything that we do on God's word, not by what's popular around us or what the media might be saying. Uh, we need to base, uh, allow scripture to drive our perception of what is true. Friends, this is such an important thing in today's time. Why do, why uh, do we need to base our trust on Scripture and not on culture or ourselves or anything else? Because the Bible tells us that our heart is deceptive above all things and desperately wicked. We can't know it. We can't trust ourselves. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. Don't trust yourselves, friends. Don't trust yourselves. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. In fact, Proverbs chapter 28 actually tells us that if you trust in your own heart, you're actually a fool. This is not an insult. It's not a criticism. It's a loving warning not to base anything on our own preferences or opinions or ideas, but to base everything that we do upon the Word of God and nothing else. This is a call of Scripture and is something that the early church practiced. So friends, I want to encourage you that when you and God disagree, you need to surrender your heart. When you find yourself holding an opinion or an idea that is contrary to God's word, surrender your heart. It's the only safe way. Don't try to bend. Don't try to do mental gymnastics around the clear statements of Scripture. Don't try to morph it into what you want. Stand on the word of God. Surrender your heart. Friends, we need to do this every day. I need to do it. We all do it. Uh, and I want to encourage you to take this posture. I think that most of the time people are in darkness, not because of ignorance, but because they do not do what they know they should do. Most of the time people are in darkness, not because of ignorance, not because they don't know something, but because they don't do what they do know. This is why in the Desire of Ages, page 489, it says that our condemnation in the judgment will not exalt from the fact that we've been in error, but from the fact that we have neglected heaven-sent opportunities for learning what is true. We are held accountable to the light that we know. And as we walk in that light, as we're faithful to that light, uh, God will reveal more light to us. Um, and, and this is the posture. We're, held, we're then held accountable to that, that light that we now know. Um, to, James chapter 4 tells us, Him who knows the good and doesn't do it, to him it is a sin. This is a principle of Scripture. And God is calling us uh, to, to live faithfully according to the light that we know. Friends, I want to encourage you. If God is convicting you somewhere in your life, you know you should be doing something, but you're not doing it. There's never a better time to give it up than right now to Christ. He's standing and he's giving that invitation to you to give it up, to follow him fully. And you and God can have that conversation together. Obedience is not why God blesses us, it's how he blesses us. Some people think that you have to earn your way to heaven. Um, you have to uh, earn God's favor through your own merit. This is, obedience is not why God blesses us. It's how he blesses us. Every divine parameter is for our own good. As we walk in God's law and surrender to him and allow him to lead us into truth, we are protected from the pain and devastation that comes from breaking his law. And we receive the blessings that come. It's not because we've earned merit before God. It's because he's developed and built the world according to certain laws. And as we live in those, we protect ourselves against destruction that comes from living outside of those. And so, um, you know, this is why um, I believe that grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to putting effort in. It's opposed to earning. 
You can put effort into your relationship with God. God actually asks you to put effort into your relationship with God. That's not legalism. Obedience is not legalism. It's earning. When you try to earn, that's the problem. Uh, We're going to skip through a few things here, uh, and I want to show you this passage here. Um, The Bereans were applauded by the Apostle Paul. They were lifted up in Scripture because of a posture that they had, and it's the same posture that we've just been talking about. When when Paul came and preached to the Berean Christians, he said that the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they received the message that Paul preached with great eagerness, but they examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Do you see the posture that the, the early church took? When they received a new teaching, they examined the Scriptures daily to see if what they heard was true. They didn't just gobble up everything that Paul said because it was someone up the front because he was a preacher. They didn't just reject everything that Paul said because it didn't fit in with what they wanted to hear. They examined the scriptures to see if what Paul said was true. I want to tell you, friends, that when we are presented with new light, with new information, the only safe course of action is not to immediately reject it. Don't just immediately reject it because you think you don't want to hear it or you don't like it. Don't just immediately gobble, up, gobble it up, but test it against Scripture. Uh, even if it's your pastor saying up the front, um, you need to test it against Scripture. Even if it's me, anyone, test it against Scripture. Uh, and to reject a, a word of warning, to reject truth in God's Word, is to reject Jesus himself, because Jesus is the Word. This is why when Jesus sent his disciples out uh, to, to, to preach, uh, he said that if they, re- if they reject you, just dust your feet off and walk off. And this is what he said. He said, he who hears you, hears me. And he who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. When you reject truth of God's word, you're actually rejecting Jesus himself. Because Jesus is the word. And so don't have a posture of rejecting truth, friends. Examine it, study it, and test it against scripture. Uh, The last lesson that I want to share with you as as we bring this message to a close is that the early church received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost uh, and they lived a life of revival. I believe one of the reasons they were able to do so so effectively is because they were filled with the Holy Spirit because they were serious about having Him. They were serious about having the Holy Spirit. Uh, Let's have a look in Acts chapter 1. Actually, we're going to skip Acts chapter 1. We're going to go straight to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, uh, we see here a picture of the disciples waiting for Pentecost. And this uh, this is what they said. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each of them. And they were filled all with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The necessary power for fulfilling God's plan is the Holy Spirit. The disciples were sitting together in one accord, waiting and praying for God's Holy Spirit that he promised that he would pour out for them. They didn't move forward. They didn't go out and begin to um, begin preaching to all those nations until they had the Holy Spirit and they went out and they spoke with, with the gift of tongues. They were waiting and praying for God's Holy Spirit provisionally before they went out and, uh, and did this great work. And so friends, today we too need to be doing a similar work. We need to be praying for the Holy Spirit uh, as we go out Uh, because to go out without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit uh, is fruitless. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we will see results uh, and that God will work mightily uh, on our behalf. Uh, In Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 and 2, where we started today, it says uh, about this revival that that is prophesied for God's people. It said that the angel would come down having great power. Well, where does power come from in a Christian's life? What is this power that this verse is talking about? I heard someone say it, the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we see that God says that we will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The necessary power for fulfilling God's plan is the Holy Spirit. It is not 
an, a meritocratic system where we, by our own strength, grit our teeth and move forward uh, by pure and sheer determination. There is effort involved, but it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that God works through and with us. And so we need the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, so many of us today sitting in a church, church folk, we like to say that God is our number one priority. If someone were to ask you what your number one priority was, um, I, I hazard a guess that most would say, you know, God is my number one priority. It flows off our mouths so easily, so nicely. It seems like the right thing to say. But you know, the way of determining what your priorities are, what your true priorities are, is not by just what you say, not by just what comes out of your mouth, but is actually by the way that you live your life. And if I want to try to understand what someone's true priorities are, uh, I can look at the way that they spend their, if they give me their calendar and their bank statements, I could probably get a pretty good idea um, of, of what their true priorities are. Because the way that we spend, what we spend most of our time on, what we spend most of our, our financial resources on, what we spend most of our energy and our um, initiatives on, uh, it tend to be our top priorities. And so I want to encourage you, friends, uh, to, to ask yourself that question. What's my number one priority? Is God my number one priority? Uh, if he is, um, then maybe uh, consider investing more time, money, and energy into him and his cause. Uh, because this is how we measure our priorities. Maybe ask God. Say, God, are you happy with the amount of time, money, and energy that I'm putting into you and your cause? And maybe he'll say, yes, well done, good and faithful servant. Or maybe there's a conversation there where he can grow you. Um, and he's challenging you to, move, take, to take a step of faith in this area. This is a conversation that I want to encourage you to have with, with, between you and God um, as he speaks to you as, as a loving father. Um, have you noticed that if something is important to you, you'll find a way to do it. But if something isn't important to you, you'll find an excuse. Have you found that to be true? You know, if something's, if something's important to us, we will make it happen. We'll find a way to make it happen. But if, something, if we don't want to do something, we'll find a way to dis come up with a reason or an excuse. We'll justify it. It'll be really good justification why we don't need to do it or shouldn't do that. And it'll be really convincing. If something's important to you, you'll find a way to do it. And so uh, the early church had honest conversations with God, I believe. Uh, they honestly assessed their own spiritual condition. And they had a posture towards God where they were serious about pursuing the Holy Spirit. Not just in lip service, but in life service. And they followed um, and sought after his Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, we have a promise of Scripture. It says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added unto you. Get the priorities right. God gives us our priority list in order. Um, in Testimonies for the Church, we read all that the apostles did. Every church member today is to do. There's some, there's some, you know, we've looked at four lessons from the early church today. We've looked at four things. There, there's others we could look at, but we, we've just looked at four things today. Um, four things that the early church did, that the apostles practiced in their lives. Um, and God is telling us today that the things that the early church did, our church members today, you and I today, are also to do. Uh, God does this for our own good and for our own benefit, to grow us and to, to help us to move forward in that abundant life that he promises us. Um, I love this statement from Great Controversy. It says, The work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of power of God than marked its opening. This revival that is coming, that is right at our very door, is the greatest revival in the history of the Christian church. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign and the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. She tells us in selective messages that a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. To seek this should be our first work. There must be an earnest effort made to obtain the blessing of the Lord. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give His Holy Spirit to those that ask Him than our earthly parents are to give good gifts to their children. We need to ask God for the Holy Spirit. Uh, but it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us His blessing. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. 
Friends of Gosford Church, I want to encourage you to be people of prayer, to be praying to God, to give you an extra measure of the Holy Spirit. And He promises you that He's more willing to give you the Holy Spirit than you are to give good gifts to your children. It's a promise of God's Word. He'll give you the Holy Spirit as you ask. And so, friends, we've seen four lessons that we can learn from the apostolic church. And I want to give you an opportunity to respond to this message today. We've looked at four lessons. Maybe you're sitting here today and you, by message number one, the lesson number one, uh, you've seen the way that the disciples loved Jesus more than their own lives and that has brought conviction to your heart today. And you want to have a posture like the early church did of loving Jesus more than anything else in your life. Maybe there's something you've put before Christ. I don't know what it is. Uh, and you want to say today, I want to, I want to put Jesus before everything else. Maybe that's a, a decision that under the Holy Spirit God is convicting you to make. Maybe uh, you've seen the way that the disciples, the early church, were understood Bible prophecy. They understood where they fit in the great prophetic timeline. And they allowed where they sat to guide their public mission. We have a mission, friends. It's the, uh, the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to preach the everlasting gospel in the context of the three angels' messages. It's a unique message, a unique mission. And maybe you've seen the way that the early church were guided by where they sat in prophecy and it guided their mission. And you, you, you feel uh, that you haven't got a grasp on where we sit in today's prophecy uh, or what our mission is. And you want to study that this week. Uh, maybe God's convicting you to do that. Maybe you've seen the way that the early church based everything that they did on the Word of God. Maybe you've been cherishing an opinion or an idea that is contrary to God's Word and you've been trying to just squeeze it in or fit it in or accommodate God's Word to suit you. And you've felt God's conviction today that you need to surrender that. You surrender your heart to God. Uh, Or maybe you've seen the way that the early church have earnestly sought the Holy Spirit and you've been convicted and encouraged by that and you want to say today, I want to have that posture. I want to seek after God's Spirit with the tenacity and single focus that the early church did as well. I don't know. Maybe there's one, two, three, four of these, uh, these lessons that God is bringing conviction to your heart today. But if God, through His Spirit, is bringing you conviction and is impressing you this week to move forward in putting one of these points into action in your life, I want you to raise your hand before God and make a commitment to Him this week that you're going to say, I'm going to move forward with the, with the strength of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to move forward in putting this in practice in my life this week. Praise God. You know, God, God looks down and he, he is thrilled by spiritual decisions as we commit our hearts to Him. Um, and I believe that as we partner with God, as we invite His Holy Spirit into our life, that He will do a mighty work in and through you and that we will experience the great promised revival in God's Word that is prophetically there. Uh, and I want to encourage you, friends, that today is an exciting and prophetically significant time to be alive and living and committed to the mission and life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the way that you have encouraged us through your word today. Lord, we see the way that the disciples and the the early church lived their life. Uh, Lord, we've seen the way they lived solely for you. Lord, I pray that you would be number one in my life. I pray this same prayer for my brothers and sisters here today who are uh, desiring to have you first and foremost. Lord, the time may come, your word tells us, where we may be required to lay down our lives for you and for your cause. In fact, around the world today, some are doing that very thing. And so, Lord, we pray that you would prepare our hearts to live our lives for you so that we would be willing to lay our lives down for you if that need be the case. Lord, do a work in our hearts. We pray for your Holy Spirit. We pray for an extra measure of your Holy Spirit. Baptize us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, do a work in us. Revive us. Uh, We seek and we ask and we claim the promise of your word. And Lord, I want to pray for all of the decisions that were made today. I pray that you would seal these decisions through the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, that as my brothers and sisters who have made commitments move forward this week, that you would provide opportunities for them to move forward in putting those commitments into practice in their own lives. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you guide us. Um, I want to thank you for Gosford Seventh Adventist Church that is a shining light and a beacon on the hill in this community. Uh, And Lord, may you bless each member here 
May you fill them with your Holy Spirit. And as we leave this building today, may we put into practice the sermon. May we finish the sermon in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.